Well, good evening, everyone. This is Gerald McKeegan up at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, it's Friday, the 11th of um, September, and uh, I'm up here in our Skybridge. Uh, Skybridge goes between our two main buildings. And in the sky bridge, you can see behind me, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but we have a full scale mock-up of a mercury capsule. The mercury capsule was the part of the first manned spaceflight program for the United States. Um, it uh, flew Scott Carpenter and Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and John Glenn and all those guys. Um, and we have a full scale mock-up here at Chabot. Uh, right now we're in the process of refurbishing it, so I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later on, but uh, what we'd like to do now, or what we want to start out with anyway, is to talk a little bit about what's up in the sky tonight. Now, I realize for most of the people in the Bay Area, uh, you don't see much of a sky tonight because of all the smoke, and uh, in fact, I was looking at an image a little while ago, a satellite image, and pretty much the entire west coast of the United States is under a uh, layer of smoke. So I don't think anybody's seeing much of the sky. But what we described for you tonight is pretty much going to be the same for the next few nights. So, uh, you know, whenever the smoke does clear, whenever you get a chance to get out and see a clear sky, uh, you'll get an idea of what to be looking for from our video. So our, our video is produced and directed by uh, Don Saito. Don Saito is a longtime Chabot volunteer. Uh, I think he's somewhere in his like 22nd year of being a Chabot volunteer. Uh, so he has uh, produced it. Uh, the narrator is gonna be Doug Olson. So without further ado, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen properly here and uh, let you watch. Doug and Don do their thing. Here we go. Hey there, everybody. Just because current conditions are such that we can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center, doesn't mean we can't go outside and look up at the real sky ourselves. This short presentation will help guide you to find several bright stars, constellations, and planets. For the month of September, the summer solstice skies will be shifting into the fall equinox system of constellations, which can be seen around 9 p.m., and it's these I'll be pointing out. Since we are leaving that time of the year when our northern hemisphere's night skies are their shortest, we can begin to view earlier in the evening, and temperatures will still be mild. How fine! By the way, if this is your first time here, yes, the constellations have seasons. For example, you'll never see Gemini the Twins during the summer, and likewise you'll never see Cygnus the Swan in the winter. We'll meet Cygnus in just a bit. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's orbital path around the Sun. That, and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night, which changes our view of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky sight, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully. But most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass using a star grouping that is easy to find, Cassiopeia the Queen, also known as the Big W. Face the sky roughly 90 degrees to the right of where the sun has just set, and look about one-third up from the horizon to the top of the sky, and you'll see it. In this version of Cassiopeia, the five stars that make up the W shape is actually her throne, which, from this angle, is upside down. The sixth star makes up the seat of the throne, which can be seen to have a rather unergonomic back. 
Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W, you might see another somewhat faint seventh star. Just connect the end of the W to that star and extend the line until it comes to the semi-bright star, which is named Polaris and is otherwise known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is. So no matter what time of night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face that star, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is, of course, an illusion caused by the Earth's spin, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact it's the Earth that's moving. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's north pole straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle. Official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of the bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Here is Draco the dragon, with his squarish head, long neck, two short legs and feet, and a long tail which arcs gracefully over the Little Dipper. Just between Draco and Cassiopeia we find our next constellation, Cepheus the king, and yes, he is Cassiopeia's husband. At this time of night he's upside down, but he's got a triangular crown, a squarish head with a pigtail at the base of his head, and he's smiling, because he's the king. I like finding him by using the non-squashed end of Cassiopeia, which points directly into his face. Just to the right and a bit down from Cassiopeia is the king and queen's daughter Andromeda, the chained lady. She's got one star as her head, a torso, and one arm pointing out away from her body with a couple of chains attached. The other foreshortened arm is curled down below, and she has one straight leg, while the other leg is up and bent at the knee. Andromeda is easy to find because the star representing her head is one of the four stars that make up the asterism known as the Great Square. An asterism, by the way, is not an official constellation, but only a familiar star grouping, like the Big Dipper which is only part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. We'll run into a couple more asterisms before the end of the evening, so keep an eye out for them. To continue, let's turn our view to the south, like so. This will flip everything we've seen to the north upside down, and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. The other three stars of the Great Square make up the wing of our next constellation, Pegasus, the winged horse. His wing attaches to the rear end of his body, and he's got four legs, neck, and a long, horsey nose. To the right of Pegasus is Cygnus the Swan, who I first mentioned near the beginning of this presentation. It's got large, sweeping wings, a long neck, and a nose. Its brightest star is called Deneb. To the right of Cygnus we find Lyra the lyre, a small Greek harp, and not a person who tells untruths. Its brightest star is the seventh brightest star in the night sky, Vega. Just below Cygnus and Lyra we have the constellation Achilla the eagle. He is a bit faint, but has a head with a beak and its bright eye Altair, two forward-swept wings, a body, and a tail. The three bright stars Vega, Altair, and Deneb make up our next asterism, which we call the Summer Triangle. You'll recall I mentioned asterisms before, with the Big Dipper and the Great Square. Though it's called the Summer Triangle, we'll be seeing this familiar star grouping through the remainder of summer and well into the fall, before losing it to the daylight of the sun. To the right of Lyra, we find our next constellation, Hercules the Strong Man. 
That square is the asterism called the keystone, and from there you might be able to make out the rest of him. A man running along whilst brandishing a large club. Somewhat low above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic, and it's also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology. Most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work we are in their debt. Our first zodiacal constellation is the constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion, or as astrologers call him, Scorpio. He's got two arms and claws, his bright reddish heart is Anne Terry's, and a long body with a stinger in his tail. Because the scorpion is a sign of the zodiac, and because the planets only move along the ecliptic where the zodiacal signs are found, sometimes the also reddish in color planet Mars passes near Antares. Mars represents the Greek god of war, Ares. So as to avoid confusing the two reddish stars, one is called Ares, and the other is called not Ares, or Antares. To the left of Scorpius is the constellation Sagittarius, the archer, with his triangular head, body, feet, and left hand holding out his bow, while his right hand is held aloft, as though he just loosed an arrow. A lot of Sagittarius is too faint to be fully seen, but he's got yet another asterism that the brighter parts of him are easy to find, called the teapot. So, unless you're at a good dark sky sight, look for the teapot, and you'll have found a good portion of Sagittarius. Just to the left of Sagittarius are two bright quote-unquote stars, which aren't stars at all, but rather the planets Saturn on the left and Jupiter on the right. If you get a chance, take a look at them through as big a telescope as you can. They are both rather spectacular. Just to the left of Saturn and Jupiter is our next zodiacal constellation, Capricornus the goat. At first glance, he looks like a child's top or an upside-down pyramid. But as you can see, he's got a horn on his head, a body with legs, and a small tail. Our last zodiacal constellation is Aquarius, the water bearer, though unless you're at a really good dark sky sight, I'd skip trying to find him, as he is quite faint. As you can see, he looks like a man holding a vessel of water that's spilling as he runs along. Our last three constellations of the night make up one large constellation, Ophiuchus, the medicine man. He's also quite faint. But as you can see, he's got a triangular head, large, upright, rectangular body. He's holding two halves of a snake, which are called serpens cauda, the snake's tail, and serpens caput, the snake's head, and his feet are just above Scorpius. And that's it. There are other, smaller, or fainter constellations out there, which I encourage you to look for using a good book, and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them by the author H. A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts were drawn. The astro-scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for their convenience they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $12. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars. Those objects are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. 
Be warned, there are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us very happy. And we'll see you in the future. Okay, well, that was pretty good. Uh, I wanted to kind of call your attention to something that, that uh, Doug said during the program. Uh, he mentioned that uh, we're getting into the fall season. And as some of you may know, fall will start a little bit later on this month. Uh, it actually starts at about 6.30 a.m. Pacific time on September the 22nd. So you got 11 more days to celebrate summer and then it's into the fall season. Uh, our seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth. Uh, many of you, I think, know that the Earth's uh, rotation axis is tilted uh, relative to its orbit around the sun. And because of that tilt, we have different seasons. Uh, during the summertime, the, the north pole of the Earth is tilted toward the sun. Uh, in, a winter, in the wintertime, the north pole of the Earth is tilted away from the sun during the daytime. And in fall and in spring, the North Pole is tilted kind of at a 90 degree angle to the line between the Earth and the Sun. And because of that, on, uh, when fall starts on this coming September 22nd, uh, the, the time between sunrise and sunset will be exactly the same on the day side and uh, on the night side. So, you know, because of the mountains and buildings and things, if you try to measure it, it won't come out quite right. But if the earth was a perfect sphere, smooth ball, uh, and you measure the time from sunset to sunrise, it would be the same as the time from sunrise to sunset. And so we call that date the equinox. And the one in the fall, we call the fall equinox or the autumn equinox. So that's coming up on the 22nd. Um, at about 6.30 in the morning. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier the mock-up of the Mercury capsule behind me, behind me here. Uh, this is one of the many venues that we have up here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, we're working our way through the pandemic, uh, looking forward to the time next year when we can reopen to the public. We've got some pretty cool plans for our reopening uh, so it's a ways way yet, but uh, it will happen. And that's when we're going to be able to have the public come back up here and enjoy all of the different uh, activities we have at Chabot, including the Mercury capsule behind me. Now we've had the Mercury capsule for many years, uh, I think close to 20 years now. And it's a really fun uh, exhibit. You can actually climb inside of it and look around, uh, flip a few switches and so on. Uh, but because it's been around for so long, it's seen better days. So we're taking advantage of the uh, uh, break here, the pandemic break, to do some upgrading and refurbishing of all of our exhibits, including the Mercury capsule. Uh, there's a gentleman up here at Chabot. His name is Jim Gordon. Jim is uh, part of our facilities crew. And uh, Jim is also the guy who built the Fritz robot that you may have seen on some of our other programs. 
And Jim has been working for the last several weeks on upgrading and kind of cleaning out the inside of the Mercury capsule. In fact, I've got a short little PowerPoint here that I want to share with you. So bear with me here while I try to make sure that that works. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, let me get it started here. There we go. All right, so um, this is what it looks like in the daytime. And it is a mock-up, a full-scale mock-up of the um, original Mercury capsules that was used in the 1960s, early 1960s, when the United States was first getting into the business of launching uh, human beings into space. Uh, it's kind of cramped inside. Um, in fact, uh, astronauts who flew in the Mercury capsule had to be shorter than five foot 11 uh, in order to fit into the Mercury capsule. So that was actually a height limit for astronauts back in those days. The original Mercury 7 astronauts all had to be under five foot 11. Um, we've had some interesting visitors uh, uh, visiting our mercury capsule this is uh, bill nye the science guy who i think most of you probably recognize we also had a mercury uh, astronaut visit the mercury capsule uh, wally shira who was one of the original mercury 7 astronauts uh, visited chabot this was several years ago uh, and he um, had tried to climb inside it. Of course, between the time he originally flew in, in the Mercury program and uh, the when he visited us, he had gained a few pounds and he had a little bit of a struggle to get in, but he finally got in there and he was uh, having a lot of fun in there. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's very realistic inside. Uh, of course, the visitors we enjoy the most having here are uh, you folks. Uh, adults and kids who come up and want to climb inside the mercury capsule and flip a few switches, have some fun with it. Uh, kids especially get, get excited getting in there. They, the imagination starts going and they imagine what it's like to be an astronaut. Uh, unfortunately, like I say, the, uh, the instrument panel inside has seen better days. Uh, quite a few of the knobs and handles have broken off over the years. A lot of the labels uh, were no longer legible and it just was seeing a lot of wear and tear. So Jim has gone to work on it and he's going to fix it all up. And the next time you see it, it's all going to be nice and bright and clean and everything's going to uh, look the way it did uh, when it was originally installed here. So I'm hoping you're all looking forward to that. All right. Okay, so uh, that's really about all we have to present tonight, but I hope uh, that you folks have some questions. Uh, if you do, go ahead and write them in on the uh, Facebook comment section. Uh, Jessica Williams, who is part of the Chabot staff, she's the behind the scenes person who does all the serious work here. Um, she's uh, monitoring and she's gonna come on here, I hope, and read a few of these questions. We'll try to answer them for you. Are you there, Jessica? I'm here. All right. All right, we do have a few questions that have come Good. in. So the first question, well, there's two actually. What is the biggest star and what is the smallest star? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, you gotta put some limits on that. Uh, biggest star in the universe, smallest star in the universe, or the biggest star that we can see. Um, one of the biggest stars that we can see uh, is a is a wintertime star. It's called Betelgeuse, or what some people like to say, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is um, a, well, actually a little over a thousand times the diameter of our sun. It's a star that's approaching the end of its life. It's in the constellation Orion. Uh, when you see Orion later on in the year, like in December and January, if you look up at Orion's uh, upper, his right shoulder, from our point of view, it's the left shoulder, uh, you'll notice a bright orange colored star. That is the star Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a very massive star. 
uh, and it is approaching the end of its life. Uh, massive stars don't live very long, and so Betelgeuse has reached the point where it is now swelled up. It's become a supergiant star. Um, as the star swelled up, its outer surface cooled, and eventually it got that orange color that you see. And like I say, it's well over a thousand times the size of our sun. Um, I'm pretty sure there are stars bigger than Betelgeuse, so I can't tell you any off the top of my head. I know that uh, the star uh, Antares, which was mentioned in the video, uh, Antares is in the constellation Scorpius. It's pretty close to the same size, I believe, as uh, Betelgeuse. These are, again, supergiant stars. Uh, but stars can actually be a lot bigger than that. So I'm sure there are stars out there that are even bigger. But if you want to look and see a couple of big stars, uh, right now would be a good time to see Antares uh, in the constellation Scorpius. It's a summertime star. And a good wintertime big star is the star Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion. As far as small stars are concerned, um, actually... <laughs> The smallest of them you won't be able to see. Uh, small stars, really small stars, tend to not be very bright and not be a, a bright color. Uh, typically, they're very red in color. And uh, so they're very hard to see unless you've got a good telescope to, to use. Uh, but there are a couple of them out there. Uh, Certainly the white dwarf stars are uh, uh, very small. Uh, they are bright uh, and you find those at the, in the middle of planetary nebula. Uh, planetary nebulas are the gas clouds left over from dying stars. And a white dwarf star is the remnant of that dying star. And there are quite a few of those out there. A white dwarf star is only a, a couple of thousand miles across. So someday our sun is going to become a white dwarf star. And uh, right now our sun is a little bit less than a million miles in diameter. When it shrinks down to be a white dwarf star, it's only going to be maybe eight or 10,000 miles across. So it'll uh, shrink down quite a bit. Um, and, and then there's the what we call the red dwarfs, which are these very small, low mass stars that don't uh, shine very bright. And many of those can be less than half the diameter of the sun. Uh, most of them are hard to see, though, unless you've got a really powerful telescope. So hopefully that's a long winded answer. Uh, what's the next question? What, mag uh, what magnification binoculars should beginners and intermediate sky gazers use? Uh, I would recommend uh, no more than 10x. So if you buy a pair of binoculars, uh, you'll see two numbers. It'll typically be something like 8 by 50 or 8 by 48 or 10 by 52, something like that. The first number, the 8 or the 10, that refers to the magnification. So uh, an eight by 50, for example, that would have a magnification of eight times, which is actually very good for, uh, you know, kind of scanning big parts of the sky and looking at a lot of objects. There are a lot of cool objects up there that you can see with that magnification. Um, the, the second number, the 50, it's sometimes 42 or 50 or 52 or sometimes even bigger. Uh, that refers to the aperture size, the size of the front opening on the two binocular lenses. Uh, the bigger that opening is, the more light it gathers, the fainter the object you can see. But uh, the bigger it is, it also makes the uh, binoculars heavier. So we really recommend something like an 8 by 42 or even a 7 by 42 or uh, 8 by 50 or 10 by 50. If you get something in that range, it's easy enough to hold in your hands um, and uh, you get uh, enough magnification where you can see some things. For example, you'd be able to see the moons around Jupiter and certainly lots of details on our moon. Uh, and there are a lot of cool objects up there. In fact, there's a whole section in most of the astronomy magazines like Sky and Telescope and Astronomy and so on. They actually have uh, every month a section just talking about the things that you can view 
with binoculars. So binoculars are a great way to get started in, uh, in astronomy. Um, one thing to note, uh, a good pair of binoculars will have a little um, uh, button on the front of it that actually unthreads. And behind that button is a threaded hole that you can use to attach the binoculars to a tripod, like a camera tripod, which allows you to keep the, uh, the binoculars nice and steady while you're looking through them. I know a lot of people have trouble with binoculars because if you're trying to hold them with your hands, uh, your hands are shaking and things, and it, it makes the view kind of uh, messed up a little bit, but by putting it on a tripod, it steadies things up very nicely. So you want to make sure to look for that when you're uh, shopping for binoculars. All right, next question. How many constellations are already just already discovered? Well, uh, it's not a matter of discovered. It's a matter of how many constellations we have officially decided. The constellations are simply groups of stars that we have given names to, and we often have stories that are associated with them. And different cultures have had, over the years, different constellations and different, you know, they regroup stars in their own way. And that became a problem uh, as uh, communication became more common and you could talk with anybody around the world. So back in the 19, uh, I think it was in the 1930s, um, the International Astronomical Union got together and they made the official map of the entire sky um, and came up with 88 constellations. So officially there are now 88 constellations in the entire sky, both the Northern Hemisphere sky that we see plus the Southern Hemisphere sky as well. And that's going to, at least for the foreseeable future, that's going to be how many constellations there are. There have been others in the past by, like I say, regrouping some of the stars. But today, the official number is 88 constellations, and they cover the entire sky. All right, next question. How are supernovas formed? How are supernovas formed? Um, Supernovas are the end of life for massive stars. Uh, one common misconception is that all stars die in supernova explosions, and that's actually not the case. Most stars die in a very slow process uh, where they become planetary nebulas and white dwarfs. Uh, it's only the very massive stars, stars that are 8, 10, or more times the mass of our sun, that die in a supernova. And that works out to be fewer than 10% of all stars. Uh, and what happens is uh, the star, uh, because it's so massive, it goes through a fusion process that produces a lot of different elements in its core. And as uh, the hydrogen at its core gets used up, it starts fusing helium, and then we get into fusing carbon and oxygen and neon and so on and so forth. Um, and as this is going on, especially late in the life of the star, it begins to swell up and becomes larger and larger, eventually becoming a supergiant star. Um, and at the same time, it's fusing heavier and heavier elements in, at its core. Eventually, it begins to fuse or try to produce what's called uh, iron 56. It's an isotope of iron. I don't want to get into what isotopes are and everything, but it's a form of iron. And iron cannot be fused. And when that happens, the fusion process at the core stops. And then the, the pressure that is pushing outward on the star, you know, the fusion process in the star is, is creating pressure pushing outward. And the mass of the star and the gravity is pulling it inwards and they're more or less balanced. But when that fusion stops, gravity takes over, the star starts to collapse. It collapses very rapidly on the interior, more faster than the outer part of it. And that produces a, uh, an explosion and the star blows itself apart. And that is what a supernova is. Now that's what we call a type to a uh, supernova, there's another type of supernova called, called a type one supernova. And that's a white dwarf, a star that actually was a low mass star that is in a binary orbit. It's orbiting around another star 
uh, the white dwarf has already gone through its life and it's now become a white dwarf and the star next to it that it's orbiting around, it has become a giant star. And when the giant star gets big enough, the white dwarf starts pulling material off of the star, um, the other star. And when enough of that material piles up onto the white dwarf, it explodes in what we call a type two supernova. So there's the two types and there's actually subcategories of these types, but uh, that's basically the idea of what uh, supernova is all about. Okay. Um, can you review uh, the visible planets and the best way to find them? Right now, the visible planets uh, are uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And if you have a clear night over the next uh, few weeks, uh, if you look to the south, say around uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night, uh, you'll see two bright objects, two bright stars right next to each other. Uh, the brightest of the two is Jupiter, and to the left of Jupiter is Saturn, and it's Saturn's quite a bit dimmer, although it is brighter than most of the other stars around it. Uh, and they're side by side. If you hold your hand out and hold your fingers, uh, three fingers up like this, uh, like the Boy Scout salute, uh, and hold it at arm's length, the separation between the two is about the space between your three fingers. Now that separation is gonna get smaller and smaller over the remainder of the year. And in fact, it will get so small that in late December, the two planets will be right next to each other. In fact, there will be one day where we will be able to see both planets in the same field of view of the telescope. Uh, unfortunately, that happens right after sunset. So uh, when we do our virtual uh, viewing here at Chabot, we wait a little bit later than that. So it's likely we won't be able to see it live here at Chabot, but we do plan to take a, a picture when we can see both planets next to each other, appearing to be next to each other in the same uh, field of view of, of the telescope. Uh, they aren't actually next to each other, that they're quite a distance apart, uh, 400 plus million miles apart. Um, Saturn is, is the farther out of the two planets, uh, but it just happens to be that they will appear to be lined up and right next to each other uh, on, I, I believe it's the 21st of December or something like that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get closer to the date. All right. All right. What is the what is a good book for interesting recent astronomy discoveries? A good book for interesting re actually I'm not sure. Um, I don't I, I don't know of any books off the top of my head, but I do recommend if you want to keep up with what's going on in astronomy, there are a couple of uh, magazines you can subscribe to, and you can subscribe either getting the paper magazine, which, you know, I'm old, so I like the paper magazine, but uh, they also have online versions. Uh, one is called Astronomy, and the other is called Sky and Telescope. Uh, and both of these magazines uh, have very good articles about current events. Uh, they, they both will show you, uh, the, you know, their monthly magazines, so they will show you sky charts for that month, uh, they will tell you about any interesting conjunctions of planets or, or uh, uh, meteor showers that are coming up or uh, asteroids that are uh, going to eclipse a star or something like that. Uh, lots of different things, plus interesting articles just about astronomy science in general. So I would really recommend uh, those as sources for up-to-date uh, information. There are a number of other websites uh, that have quite a bit of information about uh, um, astronomy and space science in general. Um, so you, you can check those things out. But uh, if you wanna stay up to date, I'd, I'd recommend either getting an astronomy magazine or a sky and telescope magazine. All right. Um, where is the best location in Northern California to view stars and constellations? Uh, <laughs> how high do you want to go? <laughs> um, 
I, I've gone to a number of locations in the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, where the viewing is just really good. Um, I taught for a long time uh, astronomy at a family camp up in Quincy, uh, which is in the northern part of the, the Sierras. It's actually, the elevation there is not real high. I think it's only about 2,500 feet, but it's well away from the city lights and everything. And they would have just spectacular skies. You could see the Milky Way clearly across the whole sky. And uh, it was pretty spectac spectacular. So uh, if you've uh, got a favorite place to go camping up in the Sierras, or if you just want to look for a good place to go up in the Sierras, you want to get somewhere where you're well away from city lights, and higher up in elevation, you know, 3,000, 4,000 feet would be good. And just get out there and get away from all the lights and you should see some spectacular skies. Which is the most recognized constellation in history? Orion. Yeah, Orion is by far the most recognizable uh, constellation. And one of the reasons for that is it has the greatest number of bright stars out of any constellation. So yeah, I mentioned Betelgeuse a while ago. There's Rigel is another one. Uh, there's a, a pattern of stars, three stars that are in a row and they're all fairly bright stars. Uh, we call it Orion's Belt. Um, and it's a big constellation and it's very easy to recognize whenever you see um, books or magazine articles or anything where they just in general start talking about constellations. It seems like they always show Orion as the example of what a constellation looks like. So Orion is by far the most recognizable. All right, it looks like we have one more question. How does the earth spin by itself? How does the earth spin by itself? Well, the earth has what we call angular momentum. Very early in the history of the solar system, when the sun and the planets were first forming, it started out as just a big, huge cloud of gas and dust. And even though it was a big cloud of gas and dust, it still has gravity. Whenever you have matter, mass, uh, you have gravity. And so over the course of millions of years, the mutual gravity of all that dust and gas began to pull the cloud in toward itself. And as the cloud began to condense, it began to spin. And as it spun, the cloud flattened out into a disk. And within the disk, the, sp the spinning disk, uh, you had matter that was falling in towards the center, forming the sun, but you also had the, all these eddies within the spinning disk of gas and dust, and those eddies would form little swirling uh, clumps of gas and dust that eventually formed the planets. So even as they were forming, they were already spinning because of all this gas and dust that was falling into the planet and because of the momentum of the spinning uh, solar disk, uh, it set all the planets spinning. Um, most of the planets spin in the same direction. Uh, there are some exceptions. Venus is one. Uh, Uranus is sort of an exception. Um, but all of the planets spin in the same direction because of the same process. So it was all that infalling material, all that uh, gas and dust, and eventually it was uh, pebbles and grains and then rocks and then boulders and then pretty soon big asteroids uh, all falling in onto the planet. And they produced what we call angular momentum, which is the spinning of the earth. And because the earth is out there in space, there's no air drag or anything to slow it down. It just keeps spinning and spinning away. And we're glad of it because otherwise we wouldn't have day and night. All right. Any other questions? I think that's all. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And I want to especially thank you for clicking on that donation button. We need all the support we can get. So please, uh, you know, before you go tonight, click that donation button and help us out a little bit here so we can uh, 
work our way towards reopening uh, next key, next year after the pandemic is over. Um, also want to make sure you're aware of some upcoming events. Tomorrow night, we will have our uh, virtual telescope program starting at nine o'clock. And then next Friday, we're going to have an event. It's actually going to be a, a virtual hike uh, hosted by East Bay uh, Regional Parks. So you want to look forward to that as well. And of course, every, every Saturday we do the virtual telescope program. And if we're lucky, if the sky is clear, we hook a camera to a telescope and we actually view things live. Uh, if the weather doesn't cooperate, we've got lots of other things we can show you, images that we've taken with the telescope and information about the telescopes and so on. So uh, you want to be sure to check that out if you get a chance as well. So again, thank you for tuning in and we hope to see you next time. Good night.